Everybody in
how silently they tumble down and come to rest upon the ground to lay a carpet rich and rare beneath the trees without a care, content to sleep their work well done, colors gleaming in the sun. At other times they wildly fly until they nearly reach the sky, twisting, turning through the air till all the trees stand stark and bare, exhausted, drop to earth below to wait like children for the snow. Autumn, autumn reminds us of the impermanence of life. It reminds us that change is inevitable. Autumn is a time for letting go and releasing things that have been a burden. Fall, as it is also called, is the right time to practice getting out of the way and letting the Holy Spirit take charge of our lives. It is a season to thank God for his many blessings. Psalm 67, 6 says, Then the earth shall yield her increase. God our God shall bless us. Good morning, I'm Jackie Castillo. Welcome to West Angeles Church. We consider ourselves blessed to have you worship with us today, and we are excited to share through the faith what God is able to do in your life today. Our hearts are full and we are sincerely grateful for the sacrifice you are making to join us online in worship. It is our hope this is only the beginning of the many visits that you will be a part of. Here's some information you might find helpful. Now that school is full swing, you may have a middle school or a high school age child that could probably use a little support with math or a foreign language. Well, Los Angeles might have a solution. Our education and enrichment ministry can offer your child tutoring in all subjects. Just go to westa-eep.org to register today. We're here to help you. As we continue to celebrate Pastor Charles and Lady Deandra's first year as our new pastor and first lady, we will be blessed by the anointed ministry of Bishop Ron Gibson today. I'm sure you'll be blessed. Here's an autumn word of encouragement. Life is a one-time offer. Live it to your fullest. Enjoy the worship service. Good morning, West Angeles. Morning. Good morning, West Angeles. Morning. Come on, let's give God all the glory and the Go praise ahead. this morning. Hallelujah. Come on, let's set the atmosphere for worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's praise Him with expectancy. Hallelujah. Come on, put those hands together. Every praise 
they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let's go before his throne in praise, in prayer. Praise the Lord. Father God, we come before you humbly in the name of Jesus, giving you thanksgiving and praise. You are worthy of the praise, Lord. We thank you for your mercies, and we thank you for your grace. You are the great I am, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Rose of Sharon, the great God, Father Almighty. Father God, we thank you, 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 we thank you this morning. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for healing our bodies, Father God. Father God, we stand on one accord that every need is met in this room. Satan, I serve notice on you. You have no place in this house. In the name of Jesus. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for blessing the first family. Look upon Charles Blake II. Give him a double portion of your anointing, Father God. Father God, I thank you for his beautiful wife and his children. Bless them, protect them. In the name of Jesus, look upon Emeritus Charles Blake Sr. and Lady May. Father God, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I just can't thank you enough for being such a good God to us. I pray that you look upon the speaker, Lord. Anoint his lips to come forth with the word. Bless his family. Bless his lovely wife as well. Father God, I praise you. I praise you for this music department. I praise you for all the departments that service this church. In the matchless name of Jesus, amen. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Hallelujah. We will have word, the word of God now. And you can follow along on the screens, my right and left. We will read it together. Amen. Amen. Ready? Begin. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me also. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to a pair of place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going and how you can know the way. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God's word for God's people. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, one more time. Praise the Lord, everybody. Aren't we glad that we know the way, the truth, and the life? Are you here to worship him this morning? And put your hands together and let's give God a shout of praise. Amen. Well, once again, I stand before you this morning to let you know, to remind you that exciting things are happening here at West Angeles. And this month marks one year that we have been honored to experience the leadership of Pastor Charles and Lady Deandra Blake. Come on, let's celebrate God for them. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, each Sunday this month, special friends of this ministry have and will join with us to celebrate this momentous occasion this milestone in their lives. And this morning, we will be blessed by the word of God, which will flow through his vessel, the Bishop Ron Gibson of Riverside, California. Let's praise God for him. God bless you, man of God. Next Sunday, October 15th, will be the Superintendent Anthony Williams from the 88th Street Church of God in Christ 
He will be with us on next week. And on October the 22nd, somebody say October 22nd. Gotcha. The actual Sunday that our pastor and first lady assumed leadership, we are going to have a very special service. And the speaker for that day will be the renowned pastor A.R. Bernard from Cultural Christian Center, Brooklyn, New York. These services promise to be powerful, and each speaker is going to bring a word that will lift and empower us as we move onward and upward. But it will not be the same without you. We want each of you to attend, invite a friend, and celebrate with us as we appreciate God for our leadership. Those of you in the lower balcony and the wing balconies, or the lower level and the wing balconies, right behind your uh, pew, you will find an envelope. And portrayed on the screens, on my right and my left, you will note an example of that envelope, wherein which several tiers of giving are noted. And the celebration committee, with approval of the board, is requesting each person to participate at the level of giving commensurate with your ability to do so. Some can give at the highest tier and others may, and we understand, must do less. But we want each of you to do something to show your support and encourage our leaders for standing tall under the tremendous pressure of these new roles. Amen? How many of you know that pressure and time make diamonds? And we continue to believe God that the best is yet to come. Can anybody agree with me today? Then let's put a praise on it. Each member is being asked to set aside a special gift of love outside of your regular tithe and offerings to contribute on that day. And we ask that you please utilize the special envelope to do so. You can begin giving today if that is your choice. For those of you in the balcony that do not have an envelope and would like to receive one, if you would just raise your hand and Usher will gladly provide one for you. Amen. I see those hands going up. God bless you. We want to be a blessing and an encouragement to our leadership to let them know that God is on their side and their best days are yet ahead. Can you help me praise God for that promise? Well, those of you online, we are grateful that you support us each Sunday and we have not forgotten about you. You may visit our website and note that special button that will also allow you to give at the level that is commensurate with your ability to do so. We want each of you to participate as well as make the hearts of our leaders glad. The special colors for the fourth Sunday, somebody say fourth Sunday, will be purple, lavender, and gray. And in show of solidarity, we are asking everyone to come dressed in those colors. Now, we don't want you to stay home. If you don't have it, come as you are. We just want to see your face in this place. <laughs> come on, everybody. Let's get on this support train. Because if you trust in the Lord and you believe in his words spoken over this house, we are all indeed getting ready to go somewhere. Our future is as bright as the promises of God. And the promises of God, they are what? Yes and amen. Come on, let's celebrate God. Hallelujah. And with that in mind, let us posture our hearts for worship. The psalmist David declared in the third division of Psalms, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. 
many there be would say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. But he answers, but thou, O Lord, you are a shield all around me. You are the glory and the lifter up of my head. You may have come into the house of God with your head hung down today, but we stand to declare to you that he will be the lifter of your head. If you believe that, come on, lift up your hands and say, Jesus, be the lifter of my head. Come on, let's worship the Lord as he is the lifter of our heads. Come on, Sister Toya.
praise for the victory on this morning, God. They said exceedingly, abundantly. The rest of that verse says over and above whatever you can ask or imagine. I want somebody to think about what you would love for the Lord to do for you right now. Just think about that one thing that you need for God to do in your life. And then after you get that one thing in your mind, I need for you to understand that God can do over and above anything that you can imagine. If you need a financial blessing and you have a number in mind that God, that you would love for God to do in that area, God can do over and above exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or imagine. Not only can God do what you're asking God for, but God can do above that what you can imagine he could do. Let's give the Lord praise because he can bless us exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or imagine. Oh, come on now, beloved. Let's give the Lord another praise on today. You have made it to the house of the Lord. You made it. If the devil was going to stop you, he should have stopped you before you made it to Sunday morning. Because we are here. We are alive. There is breath in our bodies. And let everything that has breath give the Lord a praise on this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So we just want to remind someone here that you are not alone. That you are going to make it. I know life seems to have been throwing everything at you but the kitchen sink. But you are here. And because there is breath in your body, that is an opportunity for our God to do something great to do exceedingly, abundantly above that which you could even ask or imagine. So let's give the Lord praise that we have made it to the house of the Lord on today. Well, while you're standing, I would love for us to give the Lord praise for Bishop Charles E. Blake Sr. on this morning. Amen. Come on, give it up, give it up. Let's also praise the Lord for Lady May L. Blake. Amen. And give the Lord praise for your first lady, Lady Deandra Blake. Amen. And you may be seated on today. I know that she probably does not want me to and that she never feels any bad when we don't do this, but I really want to give the Lord praise and let you know how much I love and honor my big sister, Lady Kimberly Blake Ludlow. She doesn't always like for uh, me to put the spotlight on her or to acknowledge her, but I just got to let y'all know how much I love my big sister. Amen. Thank you all so much. But we also have someone very, very, very special with us in the house of the Lord, and I would not want to go any further with acknowledging the presence of our mayor. Madam Karen Bass in the house of the Lord on this morning. Come on now, y'all. Let's praise the Lord for her. Come on now. We can do better than that. Amen. When I was first installed as pastor a little bit of time came by and I was completely blown away when I uh, <clears throat> checked my voicemail messages because you know sometimes you don't always answer calls that you don't from numbers you don't recognize 
because it could be anybody. But when I checked my voicemail messages, I got one of those messages was from Mayor Karen Bass congratulating me and letting me know and just checking in with me to see how I was doing as the new pastor of West Angeles Church, which I thought was strange because if I'm worried and concerned about being in leadership, then she's got to have twice as much on her mind about what's going on. And it has only been in recent conversations with her that I am now understanding the awesome responsibility that she has as mayor of this great city. Amen. There's more than 12 million people in the county of Los Angeles, and I don't know how many or millions of people live in Metro Los Angeles, but she is watch having them under all of us under her watch care. And there are so many out there who are holding positions and seeking just to do business as usual, but in my communication and conversations with Mayor Bass, she actually loves and cares for the people of this city. She actually moves into her job with a level of compassion and passion to be able to do the work and to do good for the people who God has given it to her to watch over and oversee. So everyone stretch your hands towards our mayor on this morning. Dear Lord, we want to thank you that you've put it into the hearts of some of us to serve your people and to serve you. Lord God, our mayor faces an awesome task of leadership. And she cannot just simply wave her hand or sign her name and make everything go okay. But Father God, we pray that you would continue to bless her with wisdom. Continue to bless her with determination and strength and passion. Father God, we thank you that you put compassion into her heart that she actually loves and wants to serve those who you've given it to her to love and serve. So we pray a special blessing on her right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's praise the Lord again for our mayor on this morning. She has got a really tough job. Amen. And even on, at this time, she will not even be able to stay with us because she's got a lot to do. There are so many thousands of us and thousands of people that are facing homelessness. It seems like it's harder than ever to own a home now or to be able to buy property. And there are so many that are hurt because of that. And she has taken it as one of her chief aspects of her job and concerns to be able to alleviate the fact that some people are getting their children up living and sending them off to school from tents on our street. She's letting me know that no one actually really wants to be homeless, that it is a myth that are being told by some folks that there's some folks that actually want to be out there on the street. Well, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Amen. And we're going to continue confronting that, but we just want to praise the Lord that we have a leader and a mayor that actually cares for people. Amen. So let's praise the Lord again for her. West Angeles is praying for you. Thank you for your service. We also want to praise the Lord. I, I remember that um, the former chairman of our deacon board and the co-founder of our CDC, uh, Chairman Carl Balton and Dr. Lula Balton are here in the house of the Lord somewhere. Where are they? Amen. Let's praise the Lord for them on this morning. And along with that, we do praise the Lord for the board of our CDC. Where are you all at? Please wave for me, the, the governing board of the, the West Angeles Community Development Corporation. The, the Community Development Corporation was founded back in 1993 in the wake of the Los Angeles riots that happened in 1992, back when I was going off the seminary to learn how I could be a better servant of the church. And the CDC has been serving as the hands and the heart of God in this community. No one can say that West Angeles don't do nothing but have church because we have been out there in the neighborhood, in the community, serving God's people. 
And we'll see how all what we've been wanting to do and serving in, in the community and what, what God has put on Mayor Bass's heart that will continue co to connect in the future. That is not going to stop just because West Angeles has a new pastor. We are going to continue intensifying and leaning into the situations that we are facing in our community. And I also want to praise the Lord for Brother Courtney Vance in the house of the Lord on the day. I know he was, it was unexpected, but... Some wonderful things as God is doing some wonderful things in his life. Amen. And we'll be hearing more about what he's going to be doing and what he, God, has done through him as we move forward. But I just want you all to know that lives are being touched. I know that we really look good here in service and on today. And I even want to thank you all for your patience. I see some, some folks fanning. Amen here in the house of the Lord on the day, and we gonna, we're we working on getting that air conditioned. As soon as I said that, more people started fanning. I see y'all out there. Y'all ain't right. Well, y'all are very right. Again, we want to thank you all so much for bearing with us. We want to thank you all so much for your patience. They let me know as I was walking into service that one of the chillers went down. And I was like, good Lord, thank you for telling me that. While I'm walking into service, amen, is. I happened to leave my other chiller in the house, you know, at home so we could get the air conditioning going. Amen. Sorry I didn't bring it with me. A chiller is about the size of a small house anyway, by the way. So I would not have that with me in my pocket. But, you know, I, as soon as they told me that, I looked to the Lord <laughs> because he can fix a chiller at any time. Amen. Well, he looked back down at me and said, well, y'all can fix it. Amen. Praise the Lord. So with that in mind, beloved, it's offering time. <laughs> we looking up to the Lord for, to ask him to do something. He looked back down at us. He said, I did do something. I sent y'all. <laughs> so, so many things that we are facing in our world and in our community today. And while we would be prone to look to the Lord to be able to do something in his miraculous power, and he could, he looks back down at us and he says, I have done something. I sent you. So here we are, God's people, living in his blessing and in his faithfulness with the power to stand and walk towards what he would have us to do on today. And I've said many times before that God has put something special, something beautiful inside of each and every one of us here. And it is our job at West Angeles to help you all grow into mature sons and daughters of God. We will always be God's children, but he wants us to be mature sons and daughters of him. But while he's revealing inside of each and every one of us what he would have us to do, he has given it to us to give, to be able to support the work of the Lord, to be able to be his hands and his heart in the world today. And West Angeles is doing so many beautiful and wonderful things to be able to help uplift God's people both inside and outside of the church. And we are now inviting you to be a part of what God is doing in this ministry. West Angeles is good ground. And your giving and your support is the only Bible that some people are ever going to read. And until they come in here and we start going over the word and teaching them more about God's love, they only see our actions. They only see your giving. And you all have been so generous. I can't let you know how much we appreciate all of the giving and the support that you all have given this ministry over the years. So please give yourselves a hand on this morning. I also somewhat want to sheepishly acknowledge um, Dr. Dutha McAllister and her announcement on the first year of me being pastor here at West Angeles. We've been moving around and working so much that it hadn't even occurred to me that I have been pastoring here at West Angeles for a whole year. Lord of mercy. Sometimes I still wake up and look at me and be like, I'm the pastor. <laughs> That means I can't stay home from church on Sunday. <laughs> but again, I consider it the great honor of my life to be able to serve you and to serve with you as your pastor. God is not done with West Angeles 
just yet. He has further for us to go. He has more for us to do. We are going to go onward and upward in him all the more. So we invite you to join with us in this way, in the expression of your giving and the expression of you offering your first fruits. And it is looked at as a sacrifice, but here at West Angeles, we look at your giving as us entering to, into partnership with Almighty God for the building of his kingdom. So we thank you and we praise the Lord for each and every one of you. So with that in mind, let all of our tithers please stand on today. We want to praise the Lord for those of you who are purposed in your heart to give 10% of your first fruits to the work of the Lord here at West Angeles. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for these who are offering up to you 10% of all that they give and make and receive. We want to thank you that you have put it in their hearts to support your work in this way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now let everyone please stand in the house of the Lord. Even though you might not be a tither, we love you. We appreciate you. We thank you for your giving. Lord God, we want to thank you for these who are planting seed into the good ground of your work and your ministry here. We want to thank you, Father God, that their giving resonates and reverberates all over the community, all over the world. We thank you so much for your faithfulness, for your blessing. We ask that you bless those that have to give, that you bless those that have not as much and show them the fullness of your provision, Father God, and your abundance. Thank you so much for each and every one of them and everything that they do. We ask that you bless these gifts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's praise the Lord again for the opportunity of being able to give. I would ask that you please be seated except for the person sitting to the furthermost right of each section and that you would remain standing and that you would all please hand your offering down toward to the right. Amen. Watch it and pray as it goes. Amen. We're all at different levels of being saved. Amen. Praise the Lord. And please give unto the Lord. Thank you again. Give him 
distinct honor to present our speaker on this morning. I've been having such an excellent time of rest and reflection during this time of moving into the time of celebration for the first year that I've been having some absolutely fabulous and the most excellent men of God and women of God able to come in and minister during this time. Have you all been being blessed? Well, we are going to keep that moving forward. Um, it doesn't mean that I've gone away. Amen. I'm sitting right there being ministered to just like the rest of you all. But it has been such an interesting and beautiful honor for me because I'm able to speak to and introduce men and women and men of God that I have known for most of my life. And one of those men is our speaker on today, Bishop Ron Gibson. Let's praise the Lord for him. And I know that he's been pastor and he is now bishop, but I've always just thought of him as my big brother in the ministry. So I could easily be, let's say, after we, you know, after we hear from um, another selection, you know, then, uh, you know, y'all going to hear from my big brother. Amen, Bishop Ron Gibson. But for that... <laughs> I would have to properly read his bio because even through looking at his bio, I'm able to even learn more about him formally as what he's done outside of just being my big brother. Amen. But Bishop Ron Gibson is the pastor of Life Church of God in Christ, located in Riverside, California. His consistent obedience to God has taken the life congregation from glory to glory. The membership has grown from only nine people in 1987 to more than 4,500, and it is still growing. During these years, Bishop Gibson's uncompromising and bold teaching of God's word has changed the lives of people both at life and around the world. He is happily married to the lovely Lavette D. Gibson and has been married to her for the past 41 years. 41 years. He has served the ministry on local and national levels. He is also the founder and president of the annual Koinonia Conference, founder and CEO of the LifeNet Community Development Corporation, and founder and CEO of Life Christian Academy Preschool and Elementary School, also called Life's School of Excellence. So many have been inspired and lifted and blessed through his television broadcast, Living in Fullness Every Day. Many of you remember him as one of the leading cast members for the Oxygen Network's Preachers of L.A. Y'all remember that show back in 2013? But he now serves as Bishop of the Dominican Republic Ecclesiastical Jurisdiction of the Church of God in Christ. Amen. I think we need to do a special trip out there to the Dominican Republic sometime soon. Amen. Praise the Lord. The beach ministry. Amen. Praise the Lord. But the objective, and y'all awake? Y'all awake out there? Just checking to see if y'all awake. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but the objective and burden of Bishop Gibson's ministry is first to assist believers in experiencing an abundant life in Christ, body, soul, and spirit, and secondly, the vision is evangelistic, seeking to win the loss by every available means possible. After this next sermonic selection by the incomparable Sister Marquis tonight, I would then ask that we would all stand and give the Lord praise for the man of God, Bishop Ron Gibson. If I can help 
somebody as I pass along. If I can cheer somebody with the word or a song, if I can show somebody that he's traveling wrong. Then my living shall not be in vain. See, you can make it. You can make it. This trial that you're going through, God is going to show you just what to do you you can make it you can make it see I don't care what's going wrong God won't let it he won't let it last too long and you're not You just gotta hold to his hand God's unchanging hand I just encourage you today to hold to his hand God's unchanging hand if you'll just be changing hand and Jesus Jesus how I trust you and how saying I will be with you no matter what you're facing today I will be with you just hold on because he says I will be hands and say trust me only if you will trust me and for this reason we lift our voice and say I'll trust you Lord I'll trust you Lord I'll trust you Lord even when I see 
Say it one more time. Lord, I thank you for turning things around for me. Just point at three people and tell them God has turned it around for you today. You have broken through on today. This is your day of breakthrough. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. 
well, I felt like I just won an Academy Awards. Speaking here in West Angeles, the church among churches. I'm so excited and honored to have been invited here to speak at Charles Blake Second's Charles Blake II's first pastoral anniversary. Let's give him an arousing applause. We honor him. We thank God for him. And I have a special offering for you, my brother. It's not much. Just a token of $5,000. Just get you a full tank of gas. Gas is so high, you know. God bless you. We thank God for him. His beautiful wife, let's give her an arousing applause. Miss Elandra, uh, Leandra Blake, we thank God for him. And I feel like I went to heaven and died being in the presence of my father, my spiritual father. The honorable, esteemed, the erudite, the handsome. Not too many men in life are more handsome than Bishop Blake. Amen. And I thank God for my father in the gospel. My, my. Let's give Bishop Blake a standing ovation, y'all. If it weren't for the life, the modeling of Bishop Blake, many of us would have the foundation we have to build upon on today. Come on, we can lift that praise and give him an arousing applause. We thank God for Bishop Blake. And beside every good man, beside every good man, listen, there's a good woman telling him when he's wrong. No. Beside every good man, there's a good woman. Let's give Lady May Blake a standing ovation. My mother in the gospel, the model, the epitome of excellence and a woman amongst women, we thank God for her ladiness, her ladiness. We thank God for the fragrance that she has that reverberates all over the world. You may be seated. It would be remiss of me not to mention my darling wife. I never thought I would get married. I grew up in the Imperial Courts Projects and moved to Palm Lane, and then Compton became gangster. And I never thought I would get married. My endeavor was to go, go to penitentiary and come out to be a pimp. That's what we learned in my socialization. But after going to Centennial High School in South Central LA, I used to see this young lady walking down the hall every day with an arm full of books. And she was so beautiful, big legs, curly hair, <laughs> micro mini skirt. It wasn't love, it was lust at first sight. And I never thought I would get married. And I, I was going with this other girl that had skinny legs. And when I saw her, I broke up with the other girl, and, and I said, how are you doing in these last and evil days? And, and start talking to her and got my Mac on, and I never thought I would get married. And she changed my mind, and I changed her name. And for the last 41 years, it'd be 42 years, the day after Christmas, I've been married to one of the finest ladies on planet Earth, LaVette Deline Gibson. That's my wife, y'all. That's my wife, amen. And I love her with all of my heart. Thank God for you. I won't be long, but I will be strong. Once again, we honor and praise God for Charles Blake II. He calls me his big brother. Who's bigger, me or you? Amen. Thank God. Bishop Blake has given birth to two kind sons. And fruit doesn't fall too far from the tree. We thank God for Lawrence, Larry Blake as well. Amen. And his darling wife. Go with me, you that have your scriptures with you. Go with me to St. John chapter number 14. And we're going to look at verses 5 and 6. St. John chapter number 14. We're going to look at verses number 5 and 6. This is a question to Jesus from one of his disciples named Thomas. Verse 5, Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? Verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. To me, it is indeed an interesting question, especially one that's coming from a disciple. Very interesting question in St. John 14 and 5, especially one coming from a disciple. 
A disciple is a person that is committed to learning. That's who a disciple is. A disciple is a person who is committed to learning. I like it when you have disciples. When you have students that are always asking relevant and necessary questions. He's talking to Jesus. You see, asking questions, I found out, ladies and gentlemen, is a sign of humility. Yes, asking questions is a sign of humility. Asking questions is a proof, in fact, of humility. You see, when a person is proud, a sign that a person is proud, in most cases, is that they don't want to ask questions. If they don't know, they'll keep trying and trying and trying, and they will oftentimes get it wrong every single time. So asking questions is a sign, ladies and gentlemen, that you have mastered pride. Asking questions is a sign that you have mastered pride. With Thomas, there's something that he doesn't know in our text. But asking questions is a sign that you appreciate the fact that in my presence, there is an informed person about the subject I'm ignorant of. And when you ask questions, you have admitted that I found a person who knows what I don't know. Thus, you ask a question. So Thomas is asking Jesus a question. In fact, there are two questions when you look at the text. We don't even know where you're going, he says to Jesus. Because he's, Jesus is telling them, I'm about, to, I'm about to go to my father. He keeps telling the disciples, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. And, and every time he kept telling them, I, I'm going back to my father. He was talking about going back to his father. But Thomas said, we don't understand what you're talking about. Where are you going, Jesus? Where are you going? We don't know where you're going. And number two, how can we know the way in case we want to follow you? How can we know the way? In other words, don't leave us without giving us information, Jesus, concerning the way. If you say you are going to heaven, if you say you're going to your father, we want to know exactly where you're going, number one. And number two, we want to also know the way, just in case we want to follow you there. So how do we move Jesus from where we are to where you are? In essence, he's saying if anything were to happen in this place and we wanted to escape our environment or any situation we may find ourselves in, how do we find our way out of our current experience? How do we know the way? And then he answers, I am the way. And I am the truth and the life. And then he says, no one, no one, there is no one, not even one person, that can come to the Father except through me, by me, Thomas. Now, what I'm about to share with you today, my sisters and my brothers, is simply the principle of protocol. Help me say the principle of protocol. Say it again, the principle of protocol. You see, how far you get in life, and how high you will fly in life is determined by your willingness, ladies and gentlemen, to submit to protocol. Every successful person should know what protocol is. You can't be successful in life without understanding what protocol is. Protocol. Somebody say protocol. protocol. Say it again, protocol. So the question is, what is protocol? Here it is. Protocol is an established way of doing things. That's what protocol is. It's an established way of doing things. It's a procedure. It is an acceptable way within a community or a group of people. It's an acceptable way or protocol can be defined as a procedure. It's how to be in a certain environment. Yeah, that's, that, that's where protocol is. Because you see, in every community, in every city, 
in every place, there is a way that people are expected to express themselves. Protocol is a strategy. Protocol is a structure that is put in place by people, by the beneficiaries, that should be followed in order for order to be maintained. You see, protocol should be maintained. It should be maintained. And if you want to maintain order in any place, there should be protocol. 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 Protocol is a procedure that should be followed. And the procedure has to be an acceptable procedure. It has to be an acceptable procedure. So if you want to move from one place to another place, there should be a way, for, a way from one place to that other place. And following that particular pattern or following that particular path, ladies and gentlemen, is actually following protocol. The reason why I really want to deal with protocol today is because I know by the nature of the information that you're going to receive from this ministry today, eventually you're going to find yourselves in places, ladies and gentlemen, that you're not familiar with. You're going to start talking to people you've never interacted with before, whether in a dream or in a vision or physically in person. Listen, somehow this anointing and this divine energy will have a way of lifting you up from where you are and all of a sudden, you're going to find yourselves in a place where you're going to want to know how you should behave yourselves in that new place. Maybe you feel like perhaps you're not ready for this message today. But I know that the anointing is ready to be released on you and release a blessing on you in this house for this occasion for this day. Yes, yes, yes. Hear this. Hear this. You see, there's a certain kind of information that you just can't keep on hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and there is no change. No, 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 no. But, but, but in every place you enter, there is a way you are expected to behave. In every place you enter, there is a way you are expected to behave. Help me say there is a way. So protocol, watch this now, is very important. You see, protocol is something that is resisted and rejected and avoided in every place. People don't like protocol. No, 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 because in most cases, it acts like a demon. Uh -huh. It seems as if it's resisting you and denying you access. And everything that appears like that, ladies and gentlemen, you have a tendency to want to cast it out and pray against it and bind it and loose it and send it to hell. But protocol, protocol, you see, there has to be protocol in every place. In every place, there has to be protocol in every organization, in every company, in every political party. And even in every church, even in your home, in your marriage, there has to be protocol. Let me hear you shout protocol. And the reason for protocol is so that order can be maintained. That's the reason we have protocol. So that order can be maintained. There is something that Paul said when he wrote the letter to the Corinthian church in Corinthian chapter number 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, around verse 40, he said, let all things, watch this, be done decently and in order. All things. He said, let all things be done decently and in order. In verse 39 of 1 Corinthians 14, he talks about speaking in tongues. He says, wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Don't stop people from speaking in tongues, the apostle Paul was saying. Don't forbid that. But in verse number 40 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he says, let all things be done decently and in order. And in what? Paul is saying everything in the house of God, watch this now, ought to be done, number one, decently and also in order. You see, everything in the house of God, ladies and gentlemen, 
has to be orderly. Everything in the house of God has to be orderly. Somebody shout orderly. Especially in the house of God. Especially where there is God. That's proof that God is in the place. Not just because a place is called the house of God, but there must be proof that there is God in the place, and the proof that God is in the place is that there's order there. And hear this. Just because God is omnipresent doesn't mean his presence is everywhere. Just because God is omnipresent doesn't mean his presence is in every place. When God is in a place, there has to be order. When, when, when God is in a place, there has to be order. <laughs> there has to be order when God is in a place. There has to be order. Why? Because when you go back to verse 33 of 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, Paul says, God, watch what he says, is not the author of confusion. Watch what he says. But of peace, watch this, in all churches of the saints. So God, I, that stuck with me. He said, God is not the author of confusion. So that tells me confusion is the absence of order. Well, let me show you something here. Paul is saying, let all things be done decently and in order. And when Paul says all things, he means all things, but he's not talking about all things. You see, there are things that you cannot do in the house of God. Although he says all things, he's not meaning all things. What the author doesn't write, he assumes the reader already knows. So when he says all things, he's not really talking about all things. You see, there are things that you cannot do. There are some things you cannot do in the house of God, whether they are orderly or not. There's just some things you can't do in the house of God. But, but if you're going to do anything that is decent, let that decent act be done in an orderly manner in the house of God. And the reason being is God is not the author of confusion. So then it means that confusion is always authored. Confusion is always authored. You see, confusion doesn't just create itself, ladies and gentlemen. It's authored. It's created. Confusion is authored, according to the word here. Confusion is created. Confusion, watch this, is initiated. Hear this. Confusion is usually the work of someone among you. It's the work, ladies and gentlemen, of someone among you. When you see confusion and discord amongst the brethren, amongst the church members, it's not coming from the sky. There is an author of co confusion in every organization. I said there is an author of confusion in every organization because the author just cannot grow out of the ground. It originates from an individual. It is authored. If you're taking copious notes, that, that's something good to write down. Confusion is authored. There is an author. And any place where there is confusion, there is somebody behind it. Any place where there's confusion, ladies and gentlemen, there's somebody behind it. And the Bible is telling us that if there is confusion, God is not the author of it. Hear this. Which means confusion is somebody's creation. Confusion was created by somebody. Confusion, 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 confusion. You see, if, if I say confusion, I know it's not God working it out. No, there is somebody behind it. So in a place where God is working, confusion is not to be seen. But in a place where people and the devil is working, confusion is the result. Every time you see confusion, you know that somebody is working on that. Every time you see confusion, then you know that somebody 
is working on that. And that somebody is not God. You see, if you're confused, even this morning, as an individual, if you're dealing with personal confusion right now, it means that there is an enemy working from within you to bring about that confusion. And it's not God. It's the work of the enemy. Working confusion. Because the Bible said God is not the author of confusion. So if there's ever going to be confusion, even right now as I'm speaking here at the West Angeles Cathedral, if there's going to be any kind of confusion, it is not originating from God. Though happening in the church. Though happening in the church, it's not originated from God. Hear this. You see, everything happening in the church is not a result of something God is doing. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing, so I'll say that again. Everything that's happening in the church, ladies and gentlemen, is not a result of something God is doing. Because, you see, you must understand that it is not, it is not only God who's coming to church. Watch this. People are also coming to church. It's not only God coming to church. People are also coming, and the devil attends service. Sometimes he rides on public transportation. So then there can be confusion in the church, watch this, because it's not only God who is attending service. Any kind of confusion. That's why there's a need to preach and speak about protocol. And if you want to mount and arise, ladies and gentlemen, to greater heights in life, if you want God to promote you to higher levels in life, make a decision right now to respect protocol. You got to make a decision to respect protocol. Somebody shout protocol. Somebody shout protocol. Now, I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs in here, we, and we need partners as entrepreneurs, people that have knowing how to partner, who also want people out there to partner with you. But there is a way to go about it. Jesus is saying, I am the way. Listen to what he says in John 14. That scripture contains the highest, watch this, John 14 and 6 contains the highest level of protocol. I am the way. I am the way. There is a way, Proverbs 16, 25. There is a way that seemeth right unto man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Here Jesus emphatically, exclusively says, I am the way. Then he says, no one. No one. Put that in your cogent notes. Help me say no one. There is no one who can find his or her way to the Father. You cannot get to the Father, Jesus says, except through me. That's protocol. There's no way you can get to the Father except through me. And I submit to you, as humble as I know how, that's protocol. And I have decided that that particular scripture in John 14 and 6 is so deliberate. Because this is where other religions, watch this now, are coming from. It's a fight against this one verse. Other religions are having a fight against John 14 and 6. You see, any religion, hear this, that puts Jesus away, any religion that puts Jesus away and replaces him with an ancestral spirit or another personality whom they substitute as a way of coming to the Father. If there is any other person apart from Jesus through which people can access the Father, it's a violation of divine protocol. <laughs> protocol. Jesus is saying, you can never go to the Father. Jesus is saying, you can never go to the Father. Look at all these other religions. They don't have Jesus as the only way. They, they have several ways to the Father. You see, don't, they don't necessarily, these other religions, they don't necessarily argue about the Father. They argue about the Son. You missed that. I used to be slow too, so I'm going to say it again. They don't argue about the Father. 
They argue about the son. I think I'll just put a quarter in the meter and say that one more time. They don't argue about the father. They just argue about the son. Yeah, they, they, they got a problem with the son. Are y'all listening to me? And so Jesus is saying here that if you want to access the father, there's only one way. That's a definite article. The way to the father. You cannot get to the father except you go through me. This is what Jesus is emphatically saying. And if you find any other way who is not Jesus, who is trying to link you to the Father, you have violated protocol. Listen, here's the chronology. It has to be yourself, Jesus, and then through Jesus to the Father. It has to be yourself, Jesus, and then through Jesus to the Father. It's called protocol. So if you're going to interact with people, as you meet people in life, ladies and gentlemen, and they don't regard Jesus as the only way to the Father, and they profess to have access to the Father, it's a different Father. Yeah. Don't even look at your neighbor. Just hold your head up and say, it's a different Father. Jesus brought that out in John 8, 44. Your father is of the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, I am the way, the lie, and the truth. Jesus can't lie any more than a man can have a baby. And that ain't happening. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. It's not, watch this now. So it's not the father that Jesus is talking about. Yes, the only way to the father, Jesus said, is through me. The only way to the, through, to the Father, ladies and gentlemen, is through Jesus. So if you profess to find your way to the Father, and it's not through Jesus, it could be a Father, but not the Father that Jesus is talking about. The Creator, Elohim, the Creator of heavens and earth. Jesus is saying, you have to come through me. You got to come through me. It doesn't matter how many days you fasted or how long you've been saved or what your title is in an organization. If you're, coming, if you're not coming through Jesus, you may be in the organization, but you're not in the organism. Manism. Jesus said, you have to come by me. I am the passage. I am the passage. Protocol. Help me say protocol. Which means there's no day that the father will say, watch this, sorry, so-and-so came to me without Jesus. There's never a day the father would say, sorry, so-and-so came to me without Jesus. No, 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 you, you'll never see that. I, he, he'll never say, I gave my consent for so-and-so to come to the father without me. No, 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 no way. Jesus is saying, you have to come through me. I'm the way. You walk to the father by me. I am the way. I am the way to the Father. So then, any person, watch this, under the sun, no matter how influential you may be, any person under the sun, no matter how rich you are, if you don't go to the Father through Jesus, that simply means where you are, there is not God the Father there. Hear this. There's no God in your church. There's no God in your religion. You don't have him if he's not received through Jesus. Coming to church does not make you a Christian. Any more than being in McDonald's makes you a Big Mac. You must be born again. Somebody shout protocol. Say with me again, protocol. Protocol should be honored. Yeah, protocol should be honored. Every day you see people rebelling against protocol by formulating religions that replace Jesus, discovering new ways, if you will, to get to the Father, other formulas of getting access to the Father other than Jesus. It, it intrigues me. So Thomas asks, how do we get to him? How do we get to him? Jesus said, follow the protocol. Just follow the protocol. 
and you will find what you're looking for. Thank you, Thomas, for asking such a question. I don't know about you, but I thank Thomas for asking such a question. How do we get to him? You see, there is a way to everything, ladies and gentlemen, that you're trying to do. There is a way to everything that you're trying to do. There's a way to prosper. There's a way to good health. There's a way to have a successful marriage. There's a way to start a ministry. And there's a way to maintain a ministry. Everything that you can attain in life, you have to discover the way to it. There is a way to it. There is a way to it. If you want to get divorced, there is a way. If you want to stay in the marriage, there is a way. But I found out what makes the protocol so important is there's a time when God starts talking about being blessed going out and being blessed coming in. God starts talking about being blessed going out and being blessed coming in, which simply means there is a curse somewhere that fights people at the point of going out and coming in. Deuteronomy 28 verse 6. There is always a force, hear this, whether we see it or not, that every time you're about to be transferred from one territory to another territory, there is a force. There are restraining forces trying to circumvent the process. Henceforth, there is a need for one to be blessed going out and coming in. Because there are restraining forces trying to circumvent the process. You need access. Listen, protocol is very important. Jesus said, I am the way. Then he says, I am the door. In St. John chapter 10, verse 9. He says, and if any person, any person enters any other way, I am the door. And if any person enters any other way, in John 10 and 9, he is, she is a thief. Which means, if he is the door, which also means, ladies and gentlemen, if there's a door, that means that any person trying to enter into that place any other way, you can't get in. You must respect the door. You must respect the door. Deep, deep theological term, respect. The door is the point of entry. The door, ladies and gentlemen, is an acceptable way of entering into the place. The door is the point of entry. The door is an acceptable way, ladies and gentlemen, of entering into the place. You see, if a house is built, think about this. No matter how ugly it is, there has to be a door. It doesn't matter how ugly the house is. There has to be a door. You can leave out any other thing such as a restroom or a dining room, but you cannot leave out the door. There has to be a door. It's a must, ladies and gentlemen. And when there is a door, the door has to be respected. That's protocol. That's what that is. You see, you have to keep searching until you find the door. And if you try to enter the premises any way other than the door, that gives you a different name. You become a thief. You must keep on searching and searching until you find the door. Why? Because the door is the acceptable way into that territory. And the gate has to be respected. As I follow this premise to a logical conclusion, I'm not out of word, I'm just out of time. I'll stop here and come back perhaps next month and give you the conclusion of the whole matter. But help me say the gate must be respected. Say so it's protocol. You see, when you find people working at the gate, hear this, the persons, the people who are working at the gate, they're not there to resist you. No. He or she is there to make sure you have good access into the place. They're not at the gate to resist you. They're there to make sure that you have good access. You see, protocol is there to make things easier for you. That's why we have protocol. 
is there to make things easier for you. And some people will drive right up to a guarded, closed gate. And the gatekeeper will politely greet them. The gatekeeper says, hello, how are you doing this morning, sir? How are you doing this morning, ma'am? Uh, do you have an appointment, ma'am? And see, when you say that, they don't like that part. They don't like that when the gatekeeper asks, do you have an appointment? The driver says, then, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? Do you know that I'm related to the person who stays there? Sir, watch this. He simply asks, well, does he know you're coming? You're related to the person who stays there. But does he know that you're coming? Simple as that. Then the person begins to fight protocol. And that's why Jesus says, you cannot come to the Father except by me. It's an established way of approach. And if you ignore the established way of approach, there's no access for you there. Listen to me. Listen to me. I used to do this before I matured and grew in the things of God. Hear this. I never allow a person to get close to me or see me knowing he or she has attacked my protocol. I never allow anyone to get close to me or even see me knowing that they have attacked my protocol because that person has undermined the structure that I have established. Uh -huh. If a person, in other words, insults my secretary, there's no way I should see him. You see, for me to know that you respect me, then you must respect my workers. The people that I have given delegated authority and the people that I have respect for. Very, very, very important that you get this. You see, there's no usher at Life Church that I haven't appointed. There's no security person in the ministry of Life Church, ladies and gentlemen, that was not put there except by my consent. Therefore, the person is called by God through me to do something in the house of God. You can never say that you respect me if you disrespect my decision to put that person in that place. You can never say you respect me if you disrespect my decision to put that person in that place. If you don't respect them, then you don't have respect for me. You don't have respect for me. So I'm giving you all this morning the answer to some of the reasons why many of you are stuck and frustrated and broke and in a rut. And a rut is nothing more than an elongated grave. So God has given the answer this morning why many of you are stuck and frustrated and broke. The reason is because you're not willing to respect protocol. That's why you're not willing to respect protocol. Somebody say, say one more time, protocol. See, you're not tested. Hear this. You're not tested at the point when you get inside here. No, no, you're not tested, listen to this, at the point when you get inside here. You're tested at the gate. You're tested at the gate. Your miracle is qualified or disqualified at your point of entry. Your miracle is qualified or disqualified, watch this, at your point of entry. Your breakthrough is determined, ladies and gentlemen, at your point of entry. David said, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And let me tell you something, in every place, you're going to find gates. In every place, you're going to find gates. And if you're not comfortable with protocol, and if you have a problem with gates, you'll never enjoy heaven. Because even in heaven, watch this, there are gates. Even in heaven, there are gates. When you look at the New Jerusalem, the Bible says there's 12 gates. There's 12 gates. Even after the devil is bound and burning in hell, there's still gates. And even though you're, there are no more thieves, 
No more murderers. No more killers. Even in the absence of demons and devils, there's still gates in heaven. The new Jerusalem is protected and surrounded by gates. From who? From confusion. From confusion. Because you see, people can create confusion. I'm a living witness. Where there are people, there is the tendency for confusion. Hear this. When I get to heaven, though, I want to ask God, why, God, do you have 12 gates around the city? Why can't we just enter into the new Jerusalem? Protocol is everywhere, ladies and gentlemen. It's everywhere. Protocol is an eternal plan. It's an eternal plan. You see, gates are a part of God's eternal plan. And if you have a problem with protocol now, or if you have a problem with gates now, you might as well cancel your reservation to heaven. Because gates are everywhere up there. It's called protocol. Prosperity is a place. There's a way or a gate into prosperity. Heavily guarded. Prosperity is heavily guarded. And some of the people that you see ushering in this place today, hear this. Some of the people that you see now, ushering here in this place right now, they never had an opportunity to sit down and talk to Pastor Charles. The people that are serving you, that are ushering in this place right now, they never had the opportunity to sit down and talk with the pastor. They never had the opportunity to have the pastors lay hands on them. And yet they're willing. Come rain or thunder, they're on their post serving. And when you look at them, if you're honest with yourselves, as I am with, with, am with myself, when you look at them, they seem inferior to many of you. You feel like you're superior to them. And yet some of you haven't done anything for this house apart from creating confusion. I knew this would be a one hit a quarter for me. I'm like Elijah, I can't come back all the time. I already know my calling. But for some of you who haven't done anything in this ministry apart from creating confusion. And being a part of the problem that we have to solve. Imagine this. The only reason we have to have someone in the cathedral to clean the to toilets is because you're a part of this church. Hear this. When you decided to come to West Angeles Cathedral, you didn't just decide to come to West Angeles. Some of you also decided to use the toilets. Hear this. Imagine we have to have people looking after the place to keep it clean simply because you were here. Why not salute such a person when you have an opportunity to meet them? Come on now. Some of y'all looking like, at me like you just fell out the ugly tree and hit every branch going down. Clap your hands and say amen, somebody. So this tells me that respect, watch this, it tells me that respect starts from you. Uh, not just respecting the bishop, not just respecting the pastor, not just respecting the son, the father, not just respecting his son, but it starts from you. Appreciating your differences. Because just because somebody is different, it doesn't mean they're deficient. Different doesn't mean deficient. Are you all hearing me? Looking at what, what other people are doing and knowing that you would not do and cannot do. Looking at what the other people are doing and knowing that you would not do it and could not do it. Respect them. Respect them. So imagine if we didn't have ushers and security around here. It would be utter chaos. But most of the time when we see these people, we oftentimes greet them with resistance. Because you think they're there to resist you every time. No, 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 no. They are there to maintain order. They are there to maintain protocol. Somebody shout protocol. We must learn how to appreciate our differences without a judgmental eye. For example, lastly, you may book an appointment 
to speak to me at 11 o'clock a.m. You may book an appointment to speak to me at 11 o'clock a.m. When you arrive for the appointment, watch this, on time, someone else comes to my office needing to see me before I see you. However, they did not have an appointment. But you had an appointment at 11 o'clock a.m. But someone else came to my office needing to see me before, they, before I saw you who did not have an appointment. So I make the decision to speak with that person prior to speaking with you. But that infringes on your 11 o'clock scheduled appointment. After speaking with that person, I'm now ready to speak with you. And upon you entering my office with disdain all over your face for, allowing, for me allowing them to see me before you. Once you're seated in my office, you ask me for $800. Once you're seated in my office, you ask me for $800. So I open my desk drawer and I pull out an envelope with cash in it. And I give you that $800. But before I give you the money, I explain to you, watch this, that the person with whom you were angry with, because they came to see me before you, came in to contribute a benevolent offering into the ministry to use for people in need. Hear this, if I would not have seen that person, before I saw you, though you had an appointment, if I had not have seen that person, before I saw you, even though you had an appointment, your request for $800 would have not been granted. The moral of the story is we prejudge or complain. We prejudge and complain about things even though we don't have all the facts. We prejudge and we complain about things, ladies and gentlemen, even though we don't have all the facts. Somebody say, help me, Holy Ghost. Say it again, help me, Lord. So the money I was giving you was given by the person who had the appointment coming from the person whom you didn't want me to see. See, you wanted to be preferred, preferred before them. Watch this simply because you haven't learned how to appreciate your own differences. That's protocol. And there are people with whom you run into in this life, as I close here, that you have to learn to respect. There are people you're going to run into in this life, even though they're different than you, even though they don't have the same socialization, their jargon is different. There are people in this life, ladies and gentlemen, I'm learning as I grow and mature and develop as a man of God, there are people you're going to have to learn how to respect even though they're not like you. I'm merely trying to help somebody learn how to love each other. And it's called protocol. Have you ever thought why it is that people cannot do without a president? People cannot do without a president. Why? Because you see people are voting everywhere. They're voting everywhere. They're voting all over the world. If it's not a president, it's a king. If it's not a king, it's a prime minister. You see, there's always, there always has to be people on top in every place created by God. There always have to be people on top in a place that's been created by God. People were created by God. Therefore, you have to find a person, according to scripture, it's not a man-made idea. It's a divine idea. Protocol is a divine idea. And protocol is being fought. People try to undermine protocol. They don't like protocol. Yet protocol is not a man-made idea. It's a God idea. And somehow people don't like protocol. So watch this. If you see me lifting up my jacket, and parting the Jordan River. If I lift up my jacket and part the Jordan River and, I, and I'm calling upon the God of Elijah, people don't like the results. They will complain because I'm using the name of Elijah. I, I'm, I'm waving my jacket and I part the Jordan River. They're not excited about that. They're upset because I'm using Elijah's name. 
They're upset because I'm succeeding Elijah. Here's the question. Why is it that you don't understand what the water is understood? Why is it that you don't understand what the waters understood? This man has power. Elisha has power. Somebody shout Charles Blake. I mean, Elisha. Has power. Say, Elisha has power. Why is it, ladies and gentlemen, that demons are responding to that kind of prayer. And you say he ain't the one. He shouldn't succeed Elisha. Why is it that you say he's the wrong one or he's doing the wrong thing in Elisha's case? You should have just kept your mouth shut. Watch this and let him do it. Uh-huh. Because you see, after he had done it and still nothing happened to the river, then you would have seen that there's something wrong with the God of Elijah. But if I'm doing it and I'm seeing it works, if I'm doing it and the mantle has fallen on me, and if I'm doing what the God of Elijah did, and if it's working, here's my question, what's wrong with that? It may not be like you want it to be, but you're not the boss. You're not the boss. You follow the leader. You follow the leader. And so if I'm doing it and I'm seeing it's working, then what's wrong with that? And people are complaining about that because it's a rebellion, hear this, against protocol. They're talking and gossiping and backbiting and smiling in your face because it's a rebellion against protocol. They want you to think, here it is, that they themselves are God. That they can move mountains. Or the plan, watch this, won't work without them. They want you to think, it ain't going nowhere without me. I'm the H-N-I-C. You figure that out. Google that, it'll tell you. Head Negro in charge. I know this is multicultural, but Negroes really got that problem. So come on, let us, and, and, and here it is. Let me give you a few. Well, I'm going to close right here. I'm going to make the altar appeal. I, I, I'm not out of word, I'm just out of time, and I respect time because we have time limits on the three services we have on Sundays. I want to make an appeal this morning, and here's the appeal. I was at a funeral on Friday. My wife's aunt passed away, her mother's sister, and it was about 100 young people there, and I made the appeal about John 14 and 6. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. Then I talked about Solomon, who had bottomless wealth. And he went on a case study to get everything in life he could enjoy. But at the end of the day, he said, all is vanity. Vanity, vanity, and vexation of spirit. He says, life is meaningless to me. He says, I worked hard and had everything that your heart could desire. I had bottomless wealth. I had everything that you can name. He says, as smart as I am after I die, here's what he said, some stupid person is going to inherit everything I have. So he said, vanity and vanity and vexation of spirit. Life is like a vapor. And life is like a vapor. But many of you, you're going after conspicuous consumptions. It's nothing wrong with being rich. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, he became poor that we through his poverty might be rich. But you also know that he made him, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Here's the takeout. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. We're all imperfect people. We all have problems. And if you don't think you have a problem, that is your problem. You don't realize you have a problem. But here's the good thing. When Jesus comes, he's going to perfect my imperfection. When Jesus comes, he's going to perfect that concerning me. So young people, you don't have to wait till you get right before you give your life to Jesus. No, he wants you. He loves you unconditionally. I was homeless. 
on drugs, suicidal, homicidal, but God stepped into my life because I had a mother. I had a mother. She knew I was addicted to PCP and heroin and, and gang affiliated. And my mother said, Ron, if you ever get in a situation where you can't call me, you can't call dad, you can't call the police, you can't call an ambulance. She said, son, listen to this. Call on Jesus. Because the Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, I got to that place on 112th in Crenshaw. I was at a party where the drinks were flowing like Niagara Falls. I just bought a, a seam of black angel dust. And the dope dealer told me, don't smoke it unless you cut it with cigarette tobacco. Because it's too potent to smoke uncut. Well, I got to the party, and some of y'all think my wife is Miss Goody Two Shoes, but she was at the party with me. I know she looked like Jesus' daughter, and she is by the grace of God. But she was at that party with me. I'm not trying to bust her out. I might have to sleep like a priest tonight. But I took an overdose because I had drank that Seagram 7. They had these big old drinks on, on rockers. And, and I forgot the dope dealer told me to cut it with cigarette tobacco before I smoked it. And I smoked it and I, and I OD'd right in the middle of Crenshaw Boulevard. Cars going north and south, ready to kill me. My friend came out and said, man, you got you to gotta, you gotta, you gotta calm down, man. You got to drink this milk. And right then, the impression of my mother's voice came to my mind. If you can't call the police, if you can't call a doctor, if you can't call an ambulance, mom said, if you can't call me, if you can't call dad, she said, son, remember this. And mind you, I used to associate with Islam because my mom kept telling me Jesus saves, but I was making more money selling my dope than she was with her hope in Jesus. So I couldn't get with a broke Jesus. But when I was totally bankrupt spiritually, I tried to call Muhammad. Maybe he was at Brooks Brothers buying some clothes to go to the mosque in and a new bow tie. But Muhammad didn't come and save me. But Brother Ron, you know, when I called on Jesus, suddenly he came into the inner sanctum of the subterranean chambers of my soul and said, accept me and live or reject me and die. I said, Lord, save me. My friend picked me up and took me to his apartment on 126 in San Pedro. I went inside his house. His brother just happened to be a, not, it wasn't happenstance. It wasn't accidental. It was providential. His brother was a Church of God in Christ minister. His brother wasn't at the party. His brother was at the house reading his Bible. And his brother took me into his apartment and I kept saying Jesus. His brother came and laid hands on my head. The more I said Jesus, the more sober I became protocol I kept calling Jesus he brought me down sober somebody shout after a while no I said shout after a while in your preacher's voice after a while not only did he save me watch, but he turned things around and filled me with the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues and ever since then I've been following protocol Mark the perfect man and behold the upright for the end of these men is peace nothing missing nothing broken in any area of your life look I took I took up too much time I don't want to make you happy twice happy to see me get up and happy to see me sit down Oh, come on, let's give the Lord praise for that word on today. Oh, come on, let's give the Lord praise on today. Somebody got just got put in touch with protocol. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no way to the Father but through me. There is someone here that has been trying to get somewhere in life, trying to figure out what to do, but our Heavenly Father through His Son has let us know the protocol. 
We've said before that God has put something great inside of each and every one of us here. But if you want to unlock that greatness, if you want to unlock that future, if you want to unlock what God has put inside of you, you got to go through the protocol. Everyone standing in the house of the Lord on today, amen. The word has been spoken and the gospel has been proclaimed. The good thing about all of this is that that way has been presented and opened for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Believing in him is the protocol. So you may be dealing with something in your life right now. You may have come to the point in time to where you realize that you can go no further. But you know that God has more for you, further for you to go, higher for you to climb. And you were realizing you could have been sitting here all of this time coming to West Angeles for years, but you realize that now is the time. Today is the day that you're going to come up higher. So if that is you, if you are ready now to go deeper into the, the protocol, the way, come on up here to the altar right now. We want to pray with you. We want you to know that you are not alone. We want you to know that you do not have to be ashamed. Come on forward down here. There are people who want to stand with you. There are people who want to pray with you. Oh, come on forward. I surrender all. Oh, come on, beloved, let's give the Lord praise. If there is someone around you who you know is struggling, who you know is on the fence of decision, come on down here with them. Stand with them. Stand with your brother and sisters. Somebody's eternity hangs in the balance. All you have to do is go through the protocol. Oh, they're yet coming. Hallelujah. Let's continue praying, West Angeles. If you're online, beloved, this is for you as well. He came so that you would have life and life more abundantly. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. Let's give the Lord praise on today. Lord God, you see those who have come before you. You see those of us who, even if they remain in their seats, they are now realizing that only through you can they have salvation. Only through you can they be more. That the answer to their situation, the answer to their problems, the answer to hopelessness, the answer to meaninglessness is through your son. So now we thank you, Father God, that you would impart your grace and your mercy on them. That as they follow the protocol and call on your son, Jesus, everybody say Jesus. Jesus. As they call on that name, you will continue to bring them closer to you. That you would continue to heal their body, that you would continue to heal their heart, that you would continue to heal their families, their marriages, to heal that situation that may, they may be facing that is trying to steal their peace. Somebody say, Jesus. Because in that name, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, there is nothing that can stand before your children. 
and keep them from you. Somebody say, Jesus. So, Father God, we thank you that you have sent the way. We thank you for your love and your mercy. We thank you for your will. We thank you for the future that you have in mind for each and every one of us here. We thank you, Father God, for the protocol. So, Lord God, there are those that are standing before you today that are looking to you, that are looking to the hills from whence comes their help. We ask that you would continue to surround them with your purpose. Continue to surround them with your power. Continue to bring out of them everything that you have put in them to bless the world and to bless their lives, Father God. We thank you that all things happen for the good of those that love you. And these, your people, love you, Lord. So we thank you that everything that they are going through is for their good. That you have an end in mind for them, Father God. We thank you for those that are now choosing to give their lives over to you completely that if any man or woman be in you they are a new creature old things passing away behold all things becoming new so we thank you for your mercy in the name of Jesus please repeat after me dear precious heavenly father we want to thank you for sending your son to die for our sins I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I believe that he came down to die for my sins. And I believe that he rose again on the third day. And I now ask him into my heart. I now ask him into my life. I ask that you forgive me for the wrong that I have done. Please forgive me for the wrong that I have been. Thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for coming into my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Oh, let's give the Lord praise on today. Somebody just got saved. Somebody's on their way to becoming more. Somebody's on their way to becoming higher. And my brothers and sisters, I want to thank you so much. You have made the most important decision of your life. God has put something beautiful and great inside of you. And you're on your way to becoming what he has made you to be. It is our job here at West Angeles, again, to help you become a mature son or daughter of God. We will be a better church because you are with us. So I want you to go with Elder John Patton right here just for a moment. We want to be able to get some of your information. We want to be able to write you. We want to be able to call you and reach out to you. And we want to walk down on this journey with you. And we thank you so much. If there is someone else that would love to join West Angeles and to be a part of this church, we want to let you know that you, we will be a better church with you joining in with us as well. So please turn to your left. And please go with Elder John Patton. If you're already saved and you're already a member, you can go back to your seat in power. And let's give the Lord praise for this word on today. Amen. You got to follow the protocol. We're going to be thinking about that all day, sir. All week, sir. Let's give the Lord praise again for the word and for speaking through Bishop Ron Gibson on this morning. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, everyone standing. Amen. I hope that you have been blessed by this word. I hope that you have been fortified. I hope that you have been inspired. And we are going to leave here in God's power. Precious Lord, we want to thank you for this time together today. We want to thank you for the word that you have imparted upon us today. We want to thank you that you are making us better and better every day. So, Father God, we ask as we leave this place today that we would never leave your presence. 
continue to cover us and, and to surround us with your purpose and your will. Father God, bind us together as one. Teach us to love each other. Teach us to lift each other. Teach us to pray for one another. Until we meet again so we can celebrate your greatness, your mercy, and your power. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.